Good morning or good afternoon, Carl, here in the Czech Republic. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. What time is it in Indonesia? Well, it's four o'clock. I've had good time to wake up and have coffee and get through most of my day. It's four in the afternoon here. Oh, interesting. So uh, what have you been up to today? It's Friday. Is that a lazy day? You said a long morning? Um, I, I have the uh, final session of a training course um, that I'm running. It finishes later the, this evening. So I've been prepping for that mostly. Yes, yes, I know. And uh, what course is that, if I may ask? It's a TESOL course that I run through my institution, JLA. Um, it's a, it's a six week course online. So we're just finishing that off today. Mm -hmm. What is TESOL for those who don't know? Oh yeah, it's, um, teaching English to speakers of other languages. Um, and often, uh, I think in, in the UK, it's quite popular to call that industry, the ESOL. Um, but other countries tend to prefer EFL or ESL. So you might know TEFL, TESOL, things like that as well. What are the students like? Do you, well, do you have a comparison actually with students from other countries? What are their struggles? Yeah. Um, so I've taught all ages, basically. Um, I've spent most of my career teaching young adults and adults. That's sort of my preference. But um, throughout my career, I've taught from preschool, through all of the school years. I've taught at college and a lot of professional adults. And then of course, teacher training with professional teachers. Um, as far as the learners, the, the English learners go, um, you know, as with any, any country, any kind of language background, they have their own language challenges that are um, sort of based on L1 interference often, right? So uh, certain pronunciations that are hard for them. Um, a particular challenge here, you know, the, the, gra the grammar is very different. As you move around Europe, you know, a lot of the European languages actually have quite quite similar grammar to English, right? Um, so there's kind of similar foundations. Uh, Indonesian doesn't share a lot of that. So tenses are very different, um, you know, uh, uh, pronouns. They have here a, um, a very formality based language so depending on whom you're speaking to you'll use different words and different language so there's quite a lot of difference between Indonesian and English and that shows up a lot in the the difficulties the students have um, one one particular thing that's also common in parts of Europe I suppose um, but they have here they only have one pronoun for um, uh, one third person pronoun so there's no he or she um, yeah. there's no sex based or gender there so um, they often mix that up when they speak English. They'll call, they'll say, you know, oh, I met Nina. He's really friendly, you know, because they don't have, they're not used that to it. That happens to people even with L1 not being Indonesian. Happens here yeah, all the common. time. Right. He, she just, yeah, people mix it up a lot. So right. what is that, uh, what exactly is it that you focus on when you um, come into a uh, class uh, full of teacher teachers, or is it more one on one? How do you go yeah, about I prefer it? To do, I'm I'm doing a bit more of both now. I prefer to do, or I, I have typically done group classes, um, either um, you know public training where uh, people sign up and and we you know we get a class together of somewhere between I don't know six and ten trainees, or in school development where I'm working with the faculty and that can be much larger. Um, you know, anywhere between 30 and 100 teachers, depending on the school. Um, but recently I started doing more one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, so that's something I'm doing fairly newly. Um, so a mix of all of the above, I suppose. But the focus is always on getting the teachers to teach more applied, engaging approaches to teaching, um, trying to move away from the sort of, you know, the traditional teacher-centric model that we're all familiar with, right? We probably had that when we were students at school as well. Um, and so that's frontal, the- Frontal teaching, yeah, just frontal, yeah. yeah. Teacher is God standing up. That's right, you know, social, social knowledge, the, the transfer, knowledge transfer model, all of those things that we'll be very, very familiar with as students. Um, it's, it's focuses there.
and that is still happening in in indonesia yeah it's very traditional like that or are there any seeds of innovation have you yeah, I mean, seen there's always, any? there's always kind of seeds and pockets i think actually the the thing that i've become increasingly aware of throughout my career is that really this is true for most countries um and so what seemed to me to be a particular problem here it turns out is really just quite a global thing um there are a couple so and, and and as with you know whether you go global or local it's always the same there are pockets you know there are seeds so like even on the global scale you can say oh there are some countries that have got you know unique approaches or some country but as a as a global phenomenon it's it's pretty similar and then the same when you come down to a country like like indonesia you know at the country level it's all pretty traditional mainstream um there's one or two institutions here and there there are obviously individual teachers who are trying to do things differently but as a as a country and as a system it's very traditional and very formal yeah the goal really that i suppose is twofold um to connect those teachers who already have this you know mentality the teachers who are already doing things differently and recognize the the importance of change um you know it's about connecting and bringing those people together um so that there's a place that they can partly seek support you know it can be quite isolating if you're in an institution that's very traditional in a system that's very traditional and you're the only teacher who's trying to do things differently uh that can be very isolating um and it can be very kind of demotivating and, and i think a lot of teachers um uh, maybe have a bit of a um a bit of a rebel mentality to begin with and then lose it over time as they just kind of get beaten down and given up or they give up and they just kind of go with the flow and uh they they just kind of you know bow to the to the traditional mainstream kind of tide because it's just quite overwhelming and you can find yourself um as i say kind of ostracized by the faculty if you're seen to be doing something too radical you can find yourself worrying about your job if the uh you know if the management the the school administration doesn't agree with what you're doing your job can be at risk so a lot of teachers just kind of give up i think and so the part of the 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 main kind of the first goal was to bring those people together and and provide a bit of support though it be from a distance you know so that those teachers realize that they're not alone and also they have someone to talk to you know look for help look for suggestions um and just a bit of moral support but then as well to try to bring more people into that fold as well people who maybe are more traditional but you know uh helping them recognize or maybe they've got some questions or maybe they've you know had some experiences and uh trying to help those people realize and recognize the the value and bring them on board and hopefully you know grow that community um not just with people who already think the way we do but getting more people to think that way as well or connecting with people like me and exactly. finding each other and exactly. building this network of support teacher trainers or people who um whose uh vision and mission is to again humanize um the language education or education in general because you are not only focusing on language teachers right you're focusing on all the teachers that's right yeah my my teaching career started in uh in language obviously and most of the work that i've done with teachers has been with um with language teachers but in the last two or three years um i've started to expand out of that um that kind of narrow field of language teaching and really the goal there has been you know everything that we're talking about being on the fringes um is the case in language teaching um you know so so we can feel like we're out of the mainstream but the lang the field of language teaching at least has the tefl tesol industry which is where a lot of these ideas reside right so the 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 tefl or the tesol methodology is more practical is more student centered um i mean tefl's a bit of a mess in terms of what one institution thinks versus another but but generally speaking those are the principles at the core of a lot of tefl training is student centered practical communicative learning um and even then you know we feel like we're on the fringes but once you get outside of tefl and outside of language teaching these ideas are almost non-existent in a lot of other subjects and so the work that i've been doing in recent years really has been trying to take the the methodology that we're trying to make mainstream in the language 
sphere, uh, take those principles and apply them in the non-language subjects. I feel very strongly that the same principles, um, student-centered, practical, applied learning, um, should be uh, should be found in the other subjects as well. And so lately I've been working with, you know, history teachers, mathematics teachers, science teachers, to take these same principles um, that we care about in language education and apply them in, uh, in non-language subjects. So why such a strong word as rebel? What are we rebelling against? Because rebels always rebel against something. I must say it really attracted me straight away. I was like, who is this guy? What is this? I need to be part of this. So right. for me, brilliant. It, it, was it supposed to um, yeah, um, express something strongly and Yeah, I mean, I so. it wasn't necessarily meant to be provocative per se, but I mean, it is a provocative word, but it's also, you know, I mean, I, I imagine one of the reasons that it um, struck a bell with you uh, is, you know, a lot of us have, we've, we've been called that over the years, right? We've had that word used at us or to us or against us over the years. Um, and so for me, it just was quite, it was just quite a natural word to use. Um, and it, it helped ring that bell with people who kind of, um, recognized it themselves in in the title you know they go oh that sounds like me not that sounds like something I'd be interested in but that sounds like me my character my background you know so it really was it really rang a bell with some people I think which is obviously the goal um, and then you know the idea of a rebellion really is about um, going against the system um, and the the idea really is to change people rather than it's not it's not um it's not overthrowing right it's not supposed to be kind of knocking people down and replacing them the idea in a rebellion and the idea behind the rebel teacher network is to um not attack people and overthrow them but to change people's mind and get them on board the idea is if you don't agree with us now um let's work together and see if we can get you to change your mind see if we can get you to uh to to to, to move with us um so it's not a combative um word which i think it's you know i think it's a bit confusing sometimes to people but I, I prefer that to you know to a revolt for example or a mutiny or some of the other words that that mean the same kind of thing but um i think rebel is ultimately uh, an inclusive word simplest kind of definition for it in context for me is if you might sound over simplistic and it's sad that, that it needs to be said i think but if you are a teacher who prioritizes the learning outcome of your students over anything else over you know the job the, the 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 black and white job description which you know it's sad but often the black and white job description what you're hired to do you know a lot of teachers look at that and recognize that this is not in the students best interests you know and often what we're asked to do by our administrators certainly what we're expected to do by parents and you know various other uh, parties and stakeholders themselves and certainly the, the students, students which is more understandable that that's more excusable because why should yeah. they know anything right um but but yeah the, all, all manner of, of of parties and stakeholders that are asking us as teachers to do this and to do that often it's going against what's best for our students and therefore as teachers if we're going to make the decision to do what's best for our students it often means going against what we're expected to do, what we're asked to do, maybe even what we're paid to do, you know. Um, and so if you as a teacher are taking that decision and, and you know, moving towards what's best for your students, despite perhaps what you're being asked or expected, um, then that's, you are a rebel, right? That's what, that's what it means, right? You're going against the mainstream for the right reasons and that's what it means, you know. Hopefully we can all Thanks to this pandemic as well, which is pushing us to uh, being um, connected through the internet, yeah. we can yeah, it, right. we can do what what you we can do more of what you are doing. You are now interviewing teachers as well, right? You have a podcast, and you're That's helping right. others who That's are right. already uh, on the way uh, to 
to word their ideas, to verbalize their ideas and to be seen so others can um, can be attracted to that. Maybe That's they were right. a little bit hidden before, yeah? But now we can see, oh, there's this math teacher who thinks the same way like me, or there's this biology teacher or an English teacher from all around the world and we can all do it if we support each other. It's beautiful. Community, very important thing these days especially in the pandemic isn't it yeah yeah and i think it's interesting you know a lot of teachers will have found themselves um a little bit lost and a little bit isolated in the early days of the pandemic you know because they're you know for teachers often you spend you know most of your time obviously surrounded by people in busy classrooms but also you know the the staff room the teachers room um you know a, a big faculty of teachers that you're surrounded by and then suddenly you're sort of at home uh, you know, every day, and I think that can that's been isolating for everybody. Um, you know, not just teachers, of course, for everybody. Um, so I think that would have been perhaps tough for some teachers early on. Those teachers who needed that community and that support more. Um, yeah. But then, somewhat ironically, I suppose, you know, now people certainly I people are finding a more um, a tighter community by. Now networking online right by joining communities like yours and like the the rebel teacher network because now you can be a member of not just a community of proximity or oh, these are the people who work in the yeah. same school as me but maybe i don't share anything in common with them now something like the rebel teacher network is is helping teachers uh, connect with other teachers who actually feel the same and and uh care about the same things they do and that can be a much more meaningful uh community even though it's it's distant and you might never actually meet these people face to face perhaps you know maybe you will maybe you yeah. won't um but you can have a more meaningful connection because you're talking about things that you both care about um which is often not the case in the staff room you know I, i've sat in teacher rooms before and just looked around and thought now here we have 30 40 50 in a big school teachers who all could be sharing ideas best practices asking for help asking for advice you know oh, i'm struggling with this group of students can you and instead they're sitting around gossiping about which students they don't like or which parents they've had trouble with it's such a wasted resource you know so much so much knowledge and and, and competency in one room and it's just not being tapped into um and and hopefully that's what we're you know you and and, and me and others like us are trying to um trying to change I love this quote uh, from Simon Sinek, who says, a community is a group of people who agree to grow together. And yeah. that's exactly what's happening, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. When I started, it was really just kind of a hashtag on social media, you know. Uh, it was just kind of a comment that I was, or a hashtag I was appending to some of the, um, the conversations that I would have. You know, I like to start meaningful conversations. I like to get teachers thinking and, and I like to be a bit provocative and um, you know push the uh, the discourse a little bit and so I started to append this hashtag rebel teacher to that and it you know it took on a bit of traction and um, I started to refer to the rebel teacher network as those people who were engaging in these conversations and then I started the podcast um, so all of those things were just sort of unplanned you know just very kind of in the moment now they're on the rebel teacher youtube channel we have about six different podcasts from different hosts um and the goal well i don't know about the goal but the the kind of ongoing plan is to just kind of keep expanding that and um hopefully soon we'll start publishing some some books and things as well um and de uh, delivering some courses online so the goal really i suppose is for the rebel teacher network to become something of a media platform for teachers you know content created by teachers for teachers um we all share the same basic set of principles you know where yeah. student centered we're, we're, we're learning centered student centered um we all pretty much believe in applied learning we all pretty yeah. much believe in equality for students and teachers um so there are some shared principles but then we're all quite different characters as well you know there are people from very different backgrounds on the on the on the network um and uh that's nice to see you know i don't necessarily agree with every little thing that people on the network say you know but we're ha we, we're happy to share the network we're happy to be and we learn from each other and we might change each other's minds occasionally we get into debates that i think can be you know quite valuable um so it's it's not um 
you know, it's not a it's not a sort of a cookie cutter type of, of, of environment. We're we're all quite varied, but we share some some principles. And you know, I obviously invite anybody else who shares those ideas or who wants to push that discourse to come and join us and get involved. Um, and and as I said, maybe to start making content. And uh, as I said, maybe we'll be publishing books and courses in the near future. That's perhaps the next step. So the best way to um start following and taking part is to now jump on LinkedIn, I suppose, and yeah, start which, following yeah, you there. Right? Um, which I think is not common amongst your your club members. Um, so if people can and, and want to get on LinkedIn, that's certainly the best place to find me and, and the, 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 the Rebel Teacher content. But um, if people are not on LinkedIn or have some reason not to, um, then the YouTube channel, uh, which is I Rebel Teacher. Like Mm -hmm. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Uh, so people can go there and see the podcasts. And obviously, you know, this is where I shamelessly ask people to like things and, and, and subscribe, but also to leave comments. You know, when I started doing stuff on LinkedIn, I, you know, I quite liked LinkedIn because it wasn't quite the same like economy that Facebook is, you know, so yeah. um, likes help and it's nice to see the likes. But what I've always wanted is the comments. You know, I want people to comment and and participate. I want people to get involved in the conversation, um, agree, disagree, push things in new directions. So please come along, but you know, leave the comments. That's what I want to see. So get on, get on YouTube. If you listen and you agree with something, tell us how it applies to you. If you disagree, tell us why. Um, that's that's important. What do you see happening in uh, education recently? We've had a year with the pandemic already. How is education changing? We are all online now, right? Yeah, we are. I don't know how long we'll be online for. Um, it's it's really tough. It's always tough to make predictions, you know. Um, but my concern from the early days of the pandemic, you know, the early months, through until now, I, I, I still have the same concern is that any progress that we, you know, some of the things that I see as progress are instead being labeled as compromise, right? So people, quite understandably, people are not particularly happy with the circumstances that we're under right now. I mean, nobody is absolutely happy, right? There's a lot about this that's horrible, of course, but there are some things that have come out of this that maybe started as a compromise that some of us have recognized as um, as positive, as potentially progress. You know, some of the things that are being done online provide benefit to both the teachers and the students, but even those things are being kind of overlooked as compromise instead, you know, we're forced to do it. Um, and a lot of these things that I see as, as possible progress my worry is that once you know vaccinations become widespread and and things return to uh, some form of normalcy and kids are back in school and teachers are back a lot of these things will be forgotten you know people will kind of brush them off their hands and be glad to be back in school which they should be but then they'll they'll put all of those things back in a box and 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 run away from them um so i think that you know we we're seeing some change now but i'm not sure how long lasting it will be um there are a lot of institutions and governments who are really just waiting to get back to the way things were always done which is not going to be i think 100 positive i think that we're, we're, we're going to see a lot of possible progress wasted which is what i'm most concerned about um so that's one thing um i also if, if we look at the the progress or the process i should say uh, of how these things have happened um i think that there's been essentially three phases and this isn't just for teachers this is for for everybody really there's been kind of three phases of the pandemic as far as kind of development goes i think so in the early days, um, and we'll talk about teachers, but I think it's true for any field, you know, in the early days, it was a surprise. No one was prepared for it. And that's fine. That's excusable. None of us were right. So a lot of people felt thrown in at the deep end and they were scrambling, not knowing what to do. That was the, the first phase. Um, and so there wasn't a lot of training in place there because no one was prepared. Okay, fine. Um, but then the next phase was, um, a lot of people who would have been in charge of development, you know, the principals, the leaders, the, you know, the, the developers looked at it and said, well, it's not going to last very long. So why put a lot of budget and effort into training for something that's going to be over in a couple of weeks? Yeah. 
So that was phase two. But then, of course, it turned out not to be a couple of weeks. It's been a very long time. And um, that mentality lasted for a long time. So first the scrabbling lasted too long. Then the assumption that it would be over quickly lasted too long. Now the third phase is a lot of developers, leaders are looking at it and saying, well, the teachers, they're doing fine by themselves. They don't need us. They've, they've worked it out. They've got on top of it. They've sorted it. They've overcome it. They're really good. We're amazed by the teachers. They don't need us. And they absolutely do. You know, A lot of teachers haven't worked it out yet. I'm surprised by how many teachers are still not really familiar with Zoom and things like that, still having some of those kind of technical difficulties that that you would hope they'd worked out in the first couple of months, you know, and they're still struggling with the same things months later. But the principals, the leaders, the, the, the trainers, the institutions, the ministries, whoever it is, is just kind of looking back and saying, ah, the teachers, they've got it. They don't need us. They've worked it out. They'll sort it out. So those three phases, you know, there's three different stages of why teachers haven't been prepared. Um, um, and at each stage, it's been the teachers that are just kind of suffering and struggling and, and having to work things out for themselves, even now so long on so for those reasons as well you know i think everybody's just kind of looking forward to going back to the familiar back to what they know back to what they used to and a lot of the possible positive development is just i think going to get left behind that's what i'm most concerned about i know i saw that i saw that post and um i'm worried about the same things because we people are a comfortable <laughs> species and uh, we like to go back to what we know. We don't like change. We like the familiar and uh, that's an absolute disaster in education because this has been such an opportunity to make the shift and uh, change the mindset of so many. And I believe, I am an optimist, uh, I believe there has been an incredible change for many teachers, many, many teachers uh, in our country. I see a lot of NGOs and also private companies uh, helping teachers educate them, uh, helping the public school teachers, yeah, where uh, the, the, their uh, principal doesn't uh, supply them with uh, further education. So they go online and they learn by themselves. They even pay themselves, yeah, very often. And yeah. uh, that only shows our love for our profession and for our students and for uh, what we feel is uh is right yeah and i uh remember what i wanted to ask you as you were talking about uh the principles yeah the, yes. the principles uh one big thing um uh, one uh big issue uh that is often talked about here in the club but also elsewhere as we go through this pandemic is autonomy in learning um children are uh, learning it um uh, the hard way these days those children who are left at home without parents because parents have to go to work and uh, maybe their teachers don't have an online school every day like my daughter does from uh, 9 to 12 where they are really leading them through the process they simply yeah. send them uh, lots of tasks via uh, via email or maybe they have one consultation hour per week and then mm -hmm. off you go eight-year-old ten-year-old kid there you go and figure it out yourself isn't it time that we train our kids how to be autonomous and autonomy autonomy is yeah. a big topic in learning yeah I think this would be again one of the prince the, the the main principles of of what the rebel teacher network is about really you know that's was one of the things that we're pushing for and one of yeah. the things again that, that i think all of the members uh whether it's it's you know people following the the discussions or people creating content i think that's one of the again one of the uniting principles is we all believe in in the value of autonomy um yeah. and yeah there's metacognition there's meta learning as as a principle of that but even more broadly just autonomy you know as a as a um as a trait as a characteristic you know um it is one of those things that can only be learned through confrontation. You have to be confronted with the need for autonomy to develop autonomy. You can't be uh, lectured, you know, you can't have autonomy explained to you and then therefore become autonomous. You can only be autonomous by being expected to 
be autonomous. And so when students spend most of their time in school being lectured to, instructed, told what to do every minute of the day, um, well, you cannot learn autonomy from that environment. You learn the opposite of autonomy from that environment. Um, and so we do have mainstream school systems that are compliance oriented, conformity oriented, and that is the antithesis of developing autonomy. Um, so I absolutely think that that uh, should become one of our primary objectives as teachers working with students is, is developing that. But um, if we want to develop autonomy in our students, if we agree that that's something we care about, then it's essential that we um, we give our teachers autonomy. And that's, you know, the, the, the missing link really is that teachers don't have autonomy because they are in institutions where they're told what to do every minute of the day. I mean, one of the things that I've often talked about in my training, um, you know, often, obviously, as we've described with the Rebel Teacher Network, you know, it's often people who, uh, who find themselves in an institution that doesn't endorse the kind of progress that they're trying to make, right? They're trying to teach in a particular way or I'm training them to teach in a particular way and they feel like they're up against their institution. You know, well, my institution, my principal doesn't really endorse these yeah. ideas. And you know, one of the things that I've often said and often talked about is, you know, I said, look, the school tells you what you need to teach. Yeah. And the school gives you goals that you need to aim for. Okay. But they don't really control how you teach and what yeah. you're doing minute to minute in the classroom. So that's kind of been my kind of starting point to, to, to help teachers break through the barrier that they feel where, look, okay, it's tough, but no one's telling you what you need to say, how you need to teach. And, and you know, the more time I've spent doing this and the more teachers I've met around the world, uh, the more I find that institutions are doing that. There are institutions out there who, who really micromanage every minute of the learning experience. And that, you know, they do tell teachers, this is what you must teach and this is how you must teach it. Uh, that second part surprised me. And so, um, you know, if, if we're not giving our teachers the autonomy, you know, when we recruit a teacher, if you're a principal in the most mainstream, most traditional institutions and you're recruiting your teachers, you're looking for teachers who have qualifications and experience. And if they don't have that, you won't hire them, right? You can't get a job as a teacher in a mainstream school without the prerequisite qualifications which means you have to spend years in education. You hopefully have, you know, ideally you have several years of experience. That's the only way you get selected. And then you're told exactly what to do as if none of that qualification doesn't mean anything in the end. You have to have it, but we're not gonna trust you based on it. And so teachers spend this time amassing their qualifications, getting their experience, getting their qualified teacher status, whatever that means in various different countries so that they can get a job and then have it all ignored and mean nothing because they're micromanaged to, to every last degree. So, I mean, there's an irony there that, that I find quite painful as well. So if we want to see our students developing autonomy, we have to give our teachers more autonomy. There's something freeing, there's something liberating about becoming a freelancer and being your own boss and, you know, working to your own goals. All of that's really liberating, but it's tough right? Trying to build the business, trying to, it's financially taxing. We're, if we're teachers, we're not necessarily entrepreneurs or business people. They are not necessarily the same skill set. So a lot of teachers don't know what it takes to market. I know I've, this is a weakness for me and always has been, you know, and so um, it shouldn't be that the only way you can do what you know is right as a teacher, what you know your goals as an educator are, um, you shouldn't have to leave the education yeah. institution to do that. Yes. You should, it, it's again it, it makes no sense the best way for me to be a teacher is to move outside of the institution that's it's it's ridiculous it I, it wouldn't make sense in any other in any other field of, of you know in any in any other professional field to say the best way that you can exercise your professional skills are to leave the field to leave the institution and set up on your own so uh how in general can we become better teachers if we don't consider all this that we just talked about just pure slate yeah if you had a pure slate a newbie teacher how to become a good teacher what are your best tips for teachers um i think 
everything has a bit of nuance. It's tough to, to put the, I think the, the, the principles that I care most about are um, student centered learning, right? To keep the student at the center or at the front of the learning experience so that everything that we teach is responsive to the needs of the student. Um, but there's a little bit of nuance there, of course. We, we, that doesn't mean that we have to listen to and do every little thing that the students ask. As we mentioned earlier, the students don't always know what's best for them. And that's, you know, when you get into my uh, sort of area of education and your pro student centered learning, um, you then unfortunately can cross a line and enter into a new orthodoxy where it's controversial to then yeah. say so it's it's controversial for me to say that the students don't know what's best for them because if you're in if you go too far to the end of the student-centered learning then you know oh we have to do everything the student asks for well i don't believe that either so i don't think that we should be um you know orchestrating every element of the learning experience um and ignoring the students needs that's obviously uh wrong but then i don't go to the far extreme at the other end either you know as a teacher there is sense uh in giving the teacher some authority the teacher hopefully has um has the the theory the uh, expertise the competency to deliver an education that is um the best education for the student despite sometimes what the student thinks they want there's going to you know they're not trained educators so there's there's a bit of nuance there but we absolutely need to consider the student in everything we do and often the mainstream doesn't right the mainstream has a charter yeah. has a curriculum has everything set up and the job is to follow that regardless of what the student might want need or or, or care about so student has to be at the center of the learning experience although that doesn't necessarily mean we are beholden to every whim of the student either um, i also think that applied learning is the other one of the other main principles so i think that everything we teach um, has to be applied everything that we teach has to have some grounding in the real world in the environment that surround our students um, and we have to be able to say we're learning this today so that you can what well, there's got to be some answer to that um growing up you know one of the the biggest questions i had in class would always be what is this for why are we learning this and the teachers often didn't have an answer to that and i think that that's inexcusable if you are teaching something and the student asks you why and you don't have an answer then what are you doing? I don't know what, you know, that, that's inexcusable to me. Um, so we have to know the concrete reason for everything that we're teaching. It has to be applied. That's the other main principle. Um, and then, yeah, autonomy uh, is, is up there as well. Developing the whole, uh, the whole child, I think, is, is, a, is a phrase that people use now and, and holistic education. Where education, yes. Everything we're teaching them how to be, you know, if, especially if you're teaching young children, you're teaching them not just teaching them English, you're teaching them humanity, you're teaching them how to be a, a human being because that's something they haven't developed yet, you know. So, if you're dealing with young children, you're also hopefully developing skills like autonomy, um, but also, you know, social skills, compassion, um, critical thinking, and other kind of critical skills as well. All of these need to be part of the, of the education approach. I can uh, I can totally emphasize with that because um, I, as a parent, can uh, observe my uh, observe my feelings when um, I have reactions to different things my daughter does um, at school. Uh, one day she came from school telling me about uh, her first uh, English lesson. I was so excited about uh, their new teacher discussing the reasons for learning English with them. They were seven, eight years old, and they created this beautiful collage, uh, a mind map, basically, of all the reasons why they are learning English. This is something I do with my adult students every day yeah. in my lessons. I was so happy to see it in, yeah. uh, in a school. Uh, but yeah. then uh, there are uh, moments when I, I catch myself saying, don't worry about it. You won't need it. Yeah, I, yeah. There's too much I, of that. Don't um, worry about that. Just do, your t do the task and hand it in. 
you won't need it. And that's such a horrible thing to, to say, not, actually. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. There's 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 too much of that, I think. Um, and I don't know, there's stuff, there's definitely stuff I learned at school that I haven't needed since, but, um, you know, is useful to some people. I mean, I, I definitely recognize that there are going to be different people with different career trajectories and different interests and focuses. So there are, there are a few things that are universally uh, useful, equally useful to everybody, you know, of course. Um, but even then, it just, it needs to be made clear what it's for. You know, there, there was so much stuff that I learned at school. I say learned, it's stuff I've unlearned since. I can't remember, you know, I can't do it now. I sit, now that I work with teachers, um, in, in development, you know, I, I often have to observe lessons and I'll sit observing a maths lesson sometimes, you know, I'll sit at the back of the lesson and look around at these kind of 10, 11 year olds who can do maths that I can't do now, um, you know, but then uh, chances are a lot of them will not be able to do it either 10 years in the future, or, you know, because it's, it's going to be forgotten um, and they're not, they're not learning it for any concrete reason, you know, maths. Uh, is, is I think one of the biggest casualties of that problem. Um, it's taught so abstractly, it's taught yes. so distant from the real world that so much of what you learn has no connection with your life or your environment. It's no surprise that people find it confusing. You can find people that dislike any subject, you know, you find someone who doesn't like PE, someone who doesn't like history, but you know, you will never find as many people for any other subject as, as people that don't like maths, you know, people who hated maths, who found it intimidating. And it's, I'm very, very strongly convinced that it's because we all have this experience of maths as being some abstract, um, intangible thing that doesn't relate to life. The favorite subjects out there are always the ones that we can immediately apply. And I think all, all teaching should be that way. Yes. Absolutely. And I am the happiest parent whenever my daughter tells me, I love maths. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Because that's great. her new teacher and he's doing a great job. So she loves maths. And I hated maths and I wasn't good at it because I feared my teacher. Do you give us some tips or tricks for clients who keep making the same mistakes over and over, although we've been through uh, the explanation and practice with them a million times? Yeah. Do you have yeah. Like uh, yeah, I, I mean, I kind of do. This is one of those things that, depending on the situation, um, you know, the the real solution for this is unfortunately um, prevention. It's preemptive, right? So what we have here usually is um, something we might call a fossilized error. Um, it's it's kind of a learned a learned error, right? And you yeah. get something where somebody makes a mistake early on in their learning and it isn't corrected. Or they're given a bad model, which is more often the case. Um, so they they learn from a bad model and they they sit with it, it, it stays with them for long enough that it becomes a part of their internalized language. Now, internalization is a really important process in language learning and it's one that's overlooked by most kind of traditional teachers. They don't really, they don't really deal with it. Um, but the risk there is if you're, if you're not cautious, then you will be internalizing errors. So if you misteach something, if you provide a bad model, or if you fail to correct an error early on with a student, then they're gonna internalize that error and it's going to be increasingly difficult to rectify the longer they sit with it, the longer they go through their communicative life using it incorrectly. And then along comes a teacher who points out for the first time, oh, actually, you know, it should be this or um, it, it can be too late. Um, the only way to rectify it is through applied practice uh, and through replacement. So you have to just provide them with that model not just the explanation as to why they're wrong, although with with a more advanced learner, that's helpful as well. But you've also got to um, get them using it at a very high frequency. And you know, you say they make the mistake again and again and again. You have to correct it every time, and you have to use uh, once you've identified a fossilized error like this, an internalized error. You have to correct it um, firmly. 
we yeah. as teachers we practice a number of different types of correction and sometimes we want to give our students more room to self-correct and we want to give them that room to develop autonomy but if you've identified a, a an internalized error like this you've got to be firm with the corrections you've got to jump in you've got to interrupt you've got to correct it firmly you've got to get right. them to repeat the correction back to you and you're going to have to do that a lot of times um and the longer they've been making the mistake the the more ingrained it's become the the, the deeper the fossil is the harder that's going to be um uh, the only solution is is to uh is to really kind of hammer that in and that's why it's so 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 important to provide good models up front and to correct errors early on to prevent this from happening yes and then I would just add, once they make it through, I celebrate like crazy Absolutely. for them. Yeah, like yeah. I always celebrate for them. I I tell them, look, look what you just did. Can you yeah. say it again? And they say it and, and just owning, yeah. exactly. owning that shift, that's so big. Yeah, so absolutely. Big. And I also tell them at the same time, um, that it's okay that many people make that mistake because lots of people feel so bad. We could talk about uh, uh, mistakes and feeling bad about mistakes and apologizing for your English uh, in another interview, I believe. But uh, especially here in, I would say, post-communistic countries, we are so um, aware, yeah, so uh, aware and self-conscious uh, about everything and right. if we are not correct we we want to hide we rather most women who come to me to learn english they say i am afraid to say it i'm afraid yeah. to uh speak with mistakes because i think that other people will consider me stupid so what yeah. i do is fossilize mistakes i also assure my student that it's okay, lots of people are making this mistake, you're not the only one, and that yeah. immediately makes them feel better and somehow relaxes them. So whenever I correct them again and again, a hundredth time, they tend to start laughing about it rather than stressing about it. And I believe when you move from stress to relaxation, that's when things start to change. Definitely true. And also on top of that, I think as well, as I've just said, you know, there can be cases, unfortunately, um, and this is not a satisfactory answer, but it's just a reality. Unfortunately, there can be cases where it is too late, perhaps, to, to solve one of these, to, to rectify one of these. Um, and in those cases, you know, the um, the best way to, to think about that is it probably doesn't matter that much because a lot of these errors as uh, built on top of what you've just said about why we shouldn't be you know we shouldn't beat ourselves up about it but also if it doesn't get corrected if it can't be rectified um as long as it's not hindering communication which so many of these are not you know they're not really preventing the person from being understood at the yeah, end of the day that person you know, singular or she or, or he that type of uh, right. so yeah. many of these things don't have any real impact on your ability to communicate. Yes, we all want to be accurate. We all want to be using, you know, pristine language. Um, it, we, but but to the extent that that's not 100% possible, it doesn't really matter as long as we can communicate, be understood. The more important thing is that you can express yourself confidently and feel comfortable speaking with another person. That's far more important. And if you can do that and be understood, then a few errors, nobody cares. Exactly. And thank you for saying that because uh, maybe, maybe they just don't care so much. Maybe and, you care more right, than they right. because than them because if they cared, they would change it. They yeah. would go the extra mile and change it. So yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't sweat it. I wouldn't right. sweat it too much. Right. Yeah. Long term planning and consistency. Um, and I know something about that. I think um, it's um, those of us who are very creative and a little bit chaotic. Uh, we like to uh, be very innovative and jump on this idea and that idea. And then our materials are a mess. Uh, we have tons of papers everywhere. For compute, yeah, the screen uh, is full of different apps and notes. 
do you have any tip for this? I know it's not so much about teaching. Uh, it's more about organization. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think probably a valid approach to that would be to um, to capitalize on it and um, and you know take the advantage that comes from it, which is to kind of let your mind run free and let yourself. But maybe um, dedicate yourself. Uh, it's up to you, you know, how you schedule these things. But maybe a day a week as a kind of a refinement day, or you know, however frequently you want to do that, a couple of times a week, a couple of times a month. I don't know. Um, but a, a refinement day where you spend one day um, kind of sitting still and looking over the the chaos that you've amassed over the last week and drawing connections and i think connections uh is is the key to organization um is uh if you're not an organized person um then then connections i think is the fundamental key to uh making some some sense out of the chaos and so what that can mean is just kind of looking at you know the the mess of of ideas that you've generated and just drawing lines you know between okay this thing relates to this thing i can put these two things together um and one example i have for that that i've found really both interesting and useful is um a commonplace book uh it's it's sort of an, an old idea but it's uh it's gained some popularity in recent years i think um charles darwin kept a commonplace book john dunn uh dewey einstein all these people had commonplace books um and it's a place where you you gather your notes you collect your ideas you might do it for ideas you might do it for quotes you might do it for both um and then the focus of the commonplace book what makes it different from a normal notebook is that you 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 identify connections and so you can go through and keep notes and, and jot things down and stick things in cut things out and paste them together but then you spend some time looking back through your notes and drawing connections oh this quote that i put here you know this quote that i found yesterday actually relates quite nicely or has something in common with this quote that i found you know two months ago and in that process you'll often find connections that you didn't realize existed before and realize oh that thing actually is related to this thing i never realized that those two problems are so related and now i realize that the solution i have for this problem will help me solve that problem for example um and so there's a number of different systems you can use for a commonplace book i now keep a digital one and i use hashtags to help me connect things uh you know uh, and, and doing it digitally makes it so much easier. If you look at some of the historic examples, like I say, you know, uh, 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 John Dunn, I think, has a, as a, or no, John Locke, sorry, has a, you know, quite a well known example. Um, they're really complex because you have a book and then, you know, it's a paper book, right? So then all the pages are in order. So to draw these connections, they have really complicated indexing systems with cards and indexes, and it gets very complicated. But doing it digitally means that you can use, uh, you can use uh, hashtags or you can use, uh, you know, various different digital systems to connect ideas. And maybe one other kind of uh, uh, recommendation is um, some kind of uh, some kind of fitness, you know, some kind of exercise, um, which is something that I think for teachers in particular, you know, the teacher's day is jam packed. And if you're a teacher and a parent, which I am as well, um, you know, if you're, if you're a teacher who cares, you know, and you're making the efforts the way we're talking about here, you know, you're not just coming in, following instructions, reading things, you know, lecturing and then going home and you're done. If you're a teacher who cares, if you're a rebel teacher, the way we're talking about, you know, that's, uh, that alone is a much more, you know, involved process right the planning the the, the teaching the evaluating all everything that goes with it um, and then if you're also an active parent um, so you, you again you're you're actually investing in your child's development you're, you're a nurturing and caring and compassionate parent um, then by the time you cram both of those into the day uh, you've got very little time left to um, to do your own thing and you, one of the most important things I think to help here is recognizing that you're not being selfish when you take an hour to yourself you know it's not selfish it is necessary and um 
it's the only way you're going to keep doing the other things uh, to the maximum level. You know, you can't put everything you have into parenting, everything you have into teaching, everything you have into providing. You can't do that without also finding some time for yourself. And so whether that's, you know, taking a bath and reading a book, whether that's watching something on Netflix. Uh, and, 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 you know, I also am guilty of saying, oh, I, I you know, I do lots of stuff for me because I listen to podcasts about teaching and I read books about teaching. And, you know, these are things I like to do and that I'm passionate about, but it's all going in that same direction. And you kind of realize, oh, no, no, just, just watching some kind of, you know, crappy series on Netflix or, 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 or taking a bath or meditating. I, I like to do a bit of yoga when I, you know, and, 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 and even then I almost said it, when I can. It has to not be when you can. You have to try and kind of really dedicate yourself to having some me time as well. It's really important, I think. Oh, we are all to blame, yeah. <laughs> we are all victims yeah. of, uh, of our, our bad time management and at the same time, our passion for uh, the profession and the family. And then we also have to sleep, yeah. So planning. <laughs> Um, is not a bad idea. Thinking uh, is not of of my time is absolutely not selfish. Every now, as you were speaking, I had this um, this image in my head. This is this is the situation that I always remind myself of when I don't um, tend to my garden enough and yeah. my and my neighbor has this beautiful garden she's always looking at my lawn where there's almost nothing like oh. but she has nothing else to do that is her passion her garden is her passion my my garden is not my passion so i stop uh, feeling guilty every time i remember that i have my own passions and it's okay to have just a lawn in my garden. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to grow a bonsai at the moment. So that's another thing that I can just, it's completely separate from everything else I do, you know, is I can just spend a little bit of time tending to the, tending to a plant, you know, and, and that's just, it's just something that you can do that is yeah. separate from everything else, you know, it's important, exactly. I think. Exactly. And I think this is the best way to uh, wrap up our interview. So thank you for, um for starting this for being yet another voice um out there in uh the whole wild world <laughs> and um i am really looking forward to more networking with the teachers uh in your community i met some wonderful uh people when i was at your webinar uh, that you organized a couple of weeks ago uh, I'll be having another one of those soon by the way so hopefully you can join us again uh, maybe in a couple of weeks yeah. I would love to, and um, I wish you all so the best. Now I'll let you go and uh, have your other webinar that you are doing in your course, yeah. your yep, online right. course, and uh, we will go and have lunch. I am going to cook lunch now. That's well, right. Nice day. Have a nice weekend, That's and I hope fine. I can. I hope I can speak to all of you again. You know, join me on LinkedIn. Uh, join me on the Rebel Teacher Network, and uh, we'll uh, we'll stay connected. Thank you so much, Nina. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.